What an exciting day. The hottest show on Broadway, you guys, Dear Evan Hansen. <laughs> Congratulations, I'm so thrilled to have you here. Can you just go down the line, introduce yourself and say what your role is in the show? I'm Michael Greif and I'm the director of the show. I'm Laura Dreyfus and I play Zoe. I'm Jennifer Laura Thompson, I play Cynthia Murphy, Zoe's mom. So I'm excited to talk to the Murphy family um, because I feel like, you know, we talk about the Hansons and we know Dear Evan Hansen is the, is the title character. I'm going to assume for the purpose of this interview that people generally know the story. The show's been around for a while in several incarnations and with the cast album out, hitting number eight on the Billboard charts and in its debut, um, congratulations, by the way, I'm going to assume that people know the story. Um, can you guys talk about the characters, the family, uh, the Murphys, and where the show starts for them, and any backstory you created for them, either together or separately? Well, the show starts um, for the Murphy family with a very typical day. First day of school, Harry getting the kids their breakfast and getting them out on time, and um, it's a very average day. Connor's giving me a hard time, Zoe's giving Connor a hard time, and, um, and Cynthia's just trying to keep it all together, mm -hmm. <laughs> as usual. And um, Zoe, is, a, a, is she a junior in high school, a sophomore? Junior, yeah. Um, this is the first day of her junior year. Um, and her brother has, you know, given her nothing but trouble her entire life. And so this is an ordinary day for her. And she sees it as he's picking on her, as he always does. And, yeah. <laughs> What I love about that first scene is that in a very, very short economic amount of time, you get to see so much about the family dynamic. You get so much about the family psychology. I mean, my, my favorite moment in that scene is when uh, Zoe gets accused of picking on her brother when it's very clear she hasn't picked on her brother. Uh -huh. And you just get some sense of the strain that this whole family has been under for quite some time. I love the dynamics that you have with Michael Park, because um, who plays Zoe's father. Um, it's clear that you guys have a, a there is a backstory there, whether we know it or not, and there's a lot of tension surrounding the family that, that immediately grounds the play. Uh, I call it a play, even though it's a musical, because it feels it has so many dramatic moments that feel so true to life. And um, actually, Michael, I'd love to hear you talk about that. Unlike most musicals, this starts with a monologue, not a song, and it has a lot of elements of a real dramatic play um, that make it different from a lot of musicals. Yes, I think from the very beginning, our fantastic writers, our composers, uh, Benj Pasek, Justin Paul, and our book writer, Stephen Levinson, they really set out to write something uh, very honest and very complicated, and they knew that it would, uh, uh, they really wanted to engage everyone's hearts, but also their minds. And um, what is typical of many other developmental processes that I've been through with musicals is that in many cases, the book writer will actually provide situation, and that situation will turn into song uh, as, as the musical develops. And in this case, there were many, I think even uh, occasions where the three writers initially imagined that some of Stephen's material would turn into song, but in fact, it was so strong as prose, and because the composers who are very, very excited and sensitive to the stakes being high enough to launch into singing, that things remained as text. Um, for instance, Before So Big, So Small was a fantastic song. It was actually a fantastic monologue. Wow. But that, it, it became very clear that that should be a, a sung moment. In other cases, especially the opening, uh, it was always the writer's uh, intent that waving be the first thing that Evan sings. It's the first musical material to be associated with him. And yet we needed to introduce Evan and we needed to introduce the world of the play. So after lots and lots of development and lots of changes that we can all speak about to that opening sequence, which changed the most of anything in the developmental process, uh, Stephen wrote that spectacular monologue that so quickly sets up uh, Evan's anxiety, you get a real glimpse into who he is, you get a real sense of the comedic tone of the play, it gives you permission to laugh, and you also know immediately what Zoe means to mm -hmm. Evan. So 
I, that opening monologue is terrific, and uh, I think we all feel great about the show opening with a monologue. Yeah. Zoe is definitely the, um, the object of Evan's affections, and um, he's an incredibly shy, introverted guy. To play a character who's immediately set up as uh, sort of the ultimate, how does that affect the way that you make her human? Um, I think by not thinking of it like that <laughs> is the first step. Um, I mean, doesn't he say specifically, like, she's yeah. the only thing... She doesn't, she doesn't hear what he says in his bedroom. <laughs> I guess that's true. <laughs> it's true, but I think um, what's so beautiful about this character is that it, it's not just a love interest. She has so many f wonderful flaws, and uh, she's a warrior, you know? She, she's she been through hell. I mean, her brother has been nothing but horrible to her her entire life, and through that, um, because he was such a problem, she she tried to be, you know... And I think when siblings tend to be overshadowed by the other sibling in a negative way, um, the other sibling tends to try and overwork themselves to be seen in such a positive way. And then she's, you know, still not seen. You refuse to remember the good things. <laughs> <laughs> refuse we're to gonna, we're all gonna pick up. We're all going to pick on Zoe. Zoe is the problem. She is. She, she really so is, is she not. Is she so problem. is not. And as a parent, as a real parent and, and and playing a parent on the stage there is um that disconnect that there's she's okay so she's putting out fires over here and in it in, in, in without intention ignoring her lovely wonderful daughter who um is is self-sufficient enough not to ask for the attention that she actually needs Did you, you know we're all so dependent on the really excellent writing in the show that, that gives us all of those things to work with. You know, all of that stuff is right there on the page. You know, that moment that I just mentioned where she pipes up and she's immediately squashed mm -hmm. and it's so clear. You know, everything Jennifer just said about the family dynamic that can lead you to such a place, you're so busy putting out those fires, you take this one for granted. They're so quickly and economically set up with the, in the spectacular writing of the play. Uh, well, I don't think that it's without, um the, the scale of a great director as well. well I, I mean, I don't think that the, that we could say it's just the writing or just the acting or just the directing. I mean, it's all, it's the collaboration that really matters. And um, this show has uh, had the team in place for so long. Um, in addition to having been on Broadway for many months now, um, it was performed in New York with uh, almost all the same cast members at Second Stage and before that in Washington, D.C. Can you guys talk about having been together so long and the differences between how you understood your characters or your role as director or the, you know, the, the core of the story? What, what's changed from when you first started to where it is now? I'll start. Um, a tremendous amount has changed, and even in subtle changes, they make a tremendous amount of difference. Um, there were uh, songs that became scenes and vice versa, and um, scenes that might have started Cynthia heavy and shifted to uh, Larry heavy or vice versa. And, and we carry with us all of the knowledge of what we learned and what was once spoken um, into silent moments where we're conveying stories that we know exist within the story but are not being spoken aloud. So I think we've all, we've carried all of that experience with us and it's ended up being molded into what we have today. And um, it's, it's, I feel like we all know our characters that much better as well. And, um, and we adore each other as a family, as a cast. Mm -hmm. Laura, I'm curious as to how being three years older and still playing a teenager is affecting you. Because you are, you know, you're not a teenager in real life. Um, and the difference between uh, even just the three years that you've been involved with her, I bet you have some new insights. Yeah, I think um, what's so incredible about this character is that she has so much depth and she's so strong. And I think that time with this role has only deepened her and myself and I've been able to actually learn from this character because of how she chooses to deal with all of these problems that are being thrown at her and these you know horrible things um and I think 
yeah, I think the writing itself, we, we were given so much with Stephen's writing. Um, he wrote such a dense book, and that very first reading, it was, I mean, we, we talk about this a lot. There's like so many lines that we, we still miss because they were so wonderful, and unfortunately, for time's sake, they had to go, and for the flow of the show, they had to leave. But um, it, like Jennifer said, it just deepens the work, and it gives you such a great idea of who this person is. And so having this time and having the, the maturity to have the space from being a teenager, I think only, um, only gives me more permission to really be able to play it do you have moments that you keep coming back to and seeing new things the actors are bringing this this far into the process? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 actually you know it's a living thing, and you know there are parameters that we've all set up, and we can't sway too far from those parameters. And yet, one of the real joys I think that every audience experiences when they see the show is that they're really seeing a, a very alive dynamic between the characters. And you know, one little emphasis will change one little response. And then, as I think they're laughing because it's my job to monitor. And if we stray <laughs> Don't too do that. far, <laughs> Don't do we, that. if we stray Don't too far from that, then we'll come back. But I, I do, um, I value the growth process, and I like to see how things are changing. And honestly, before I'll put a kibosh on anything, I'll sort of watch it move a little and then be able to assess. But it is, it's a really fascinating ongoing process as people get to know the world that much more in front of an audience. I will say that rehearsing the show for Broadway because we actually made very few textual changes or, or in song between second stage and Broadway, we were able to rehearse in, in a deeper, more confident, easier way. When, when the show is, is developing, and when material is coming and going, it's all a balancing act because the, the the ground can really, really move underneath you, and you know a a, a big uh, there, there can be a big seismic change that you need to incorporate, right. and and it's always a matter of catching up. But going into this process, we all had a really good sense of what we were doing, and we were able to deepen what came before. And I think you really see the fruits of that on Broadway. How often are you at the theater these days? I know you have another little project going on right now called War Paint on Broadway. Yes, well, now that War Paint is open, I like to see each of those shows once a week. And uh, when War Paint was, was actually in previews, I got to see the first 45 minutes of Dear Evan Hansen quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then they heard lots more the about theater. the first 45 minutes for a while. <laughs> Uh, but even at that point, you know, our schedules allowed uh, a show here or there that I would see. But I really like to, especially at this early, especially with War Paint, go about once a week. And then, you know, I was very fortunate to have a very long running show rent. And then at some point it was really once a month. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to once a week for a while. I'm glad you brought up rent. Um, I was so excited about today that I had some trouble sleeping last night, so I dug out the big rent coffee table book, and I was reading through a lot of the early history Starts of with it. a monologue. Um, <laughs> that's right, it does. And I was thinking about how you have had this history of these kind of voice of a generation, groundbreaking musicals, Next to Normal is another one. Um, and I, I can't believe it's been 20 years since we lost Jonathan Larson. What do you think he would think about a show like Dear Evan Hansen and the current Broadway landscape? Uh, he would feel like everything he wanted to happen on Broadway were, was happening. You know, Lynn always speaks so movingly and lovingly about Jonathan Larson and about what Rhett means to him. And Jonathan would, you know, speak the same things about Hamilton. And I think Jonathan would, would have loved Next to Normal and understood that musicals can take you to deep and realistic psychological places. And I think Jonathan would love this musical and love the way in which those extraordinary writers have captured this moment. They've, they've made a play with music or a sens with sensational music that's character driven with a, with a sensational suspenseful plot with a backdrop of, of how we are living in this moment and only in this moment that Jonathan, I think would feel that's exactly what I set out to do. Yeah, that's great. Did you guys have musicals growing up that affected you the way that you see Dear Evan Hansen fans reacting to this show? I'm really embarrassed to say this in front of Michael, but it was Rent. <laughs> I mean, I, I think the first musical I ever saw was Les Miserables, I was six, and that was what you know, got me interested in musicals and 
still near and dear to my heart. Um, but I remember um, seeing Rent. Um, I can't believe my parents let me at the age that I saw it at. But um, I, I remember being completely blown away by the fact that the music that I loved to hear was in a musical on Broadway, and it wasn't the kind of music that I was used to hearing from a musical, as well as this story that was about heartbreak and real people and, and people that, you know, even though I was a kid, I, I felt like I could somehow relate to because it wasn't some magical fantasy world. It was real. And, um, and yeah, that, that's what really inspired me, honestly, to want to do the kind of work that we get to do every night. Uh, being of a different generation than my darling daughter. <laughs> That's how it works. Um, yeah, I, well, you're right. I had to, to be, right? <laughs> um, I uh, grew up in an era where uh, Broadway musicals were not a part of the pop culture. There was not a, a song that was something that I, and that people were gravitating to, at least on radio listening. Um, and um, the first show that I became attached to was also Les Mis. I didn't get to see it, but I got to listen and I bought the vinyl record. Uh -huh. That's what held I had the cassette. <laughs> Good I, for had, you. I had the eight track. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's my love of these contemporary musicals is that it's so listenable and I want to go home and listen to it, which is different than what I was exposed to at a young age. Um, and when I heard um, Justin and Benji's music within the context of the play, I was completely blown away. I was, I, I tweeted something ridiculous, like you've answered my call to Broadway musicals. Like I called somebody and said, please can somebody write something that is so infectious and so deeply storytelling and grips your heart and, and is memorable. And I don't know how they do it. They're miraculous, but they created exactly what I would hope that Broadway would, would, would be. Well, you all have, and it's such a gift. And you know, I, I, it's one of those ones that that I'm tempted to get up at three in the morning to line up for those few day of <laughs> tickets that are available, even though I've seen it a few times. I just keep wanting to go back, and there is something from the audience standpoint that's new every single time. And I can tell that it's new for you guys at the same time. One thing that I'm the most curious about is the character of Connor Murphy and what his legacy is with these characters that you have created. At the beginning of the show, when Connor is around, we know him as a guy who's a very difficult to his parents and he's a lot of trouble for his sister. Um, they come to understand a different side of him through an untruth that's told. By the end of the play, the musical, when that is revealed, how do they remember Connor from that point forward? Does he have any redeeming characteristics that are lingering from the fiction? I think so, in a way. Um, I think she starts to, Zoe starts to rewrite all of the experiences that she has had and her perception of them in her head when Evan starts to lie to her about this person. Um, you know, whatever form of abuse he afflicted onto her, she, you know, suddenly has a reason for it in her head and she's able to see things in a different way. And even though she realizes that it was a lie by the end of the play, um, I think that because it allowed her to forgive already, the forgiveness is already there. and. Even though it was a lie, there might be truth to it in some way. And so it kind of leaves her with this question of just, well, I, I don't know him. I just know how he treated me. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't define who he was. And it, it you know, gives her freedom in the end to really live her life without this weight that he had always had. Do you have anything to add, Jennifer? Uh, plenty. Um, uh, I never gave up on, Cynthia never gave up on Connor. Um, she understood him from birth as you're attached to your child. She knew who he was and she knew that that good person was still in him. And, um, and the struggle was, was really awful and that she never achieved her goal of breaking through is completely heartbreaking. So the moment that I find out that the perception of who I learned he was through Evan Hansen was a total lie, the immediate response is, I failed, I truly failed. However, 
what I've learned, what I've been forced to learn in playing a role of a parent recovering from the loss of a child is that there has to be something that drives you through that loss. Um, and what it is, is that Connor saved Evan Hansen. And we chose to not share the lie so that Evan Hansen could go on with a much better quality of life, that he was no longer an outcast and that it made it worth going on. And the orchard represents, of course, that achievement. Yeah. I want to take the opportunity to mention some of the organizations that you guys have partnered with because there are a lot of people in the real world who have connected with this musical because of the struggles they're going on that are going on in their own lives. Um, if you guys can help me remember them, I remember, I, I know the Trevor Project is one, um, Lady Gaga's Born This Way organization. Can you remind me what some of the other the ones Jed are? The Jed Foundation, which is a suicide prevention organization. Mm -hmm. And I know that Mike Feist talks a lot about Live Through This, um, mm -hmm. which is a website that... Um, that he initially researched mm -hmm. in order to gain insight into the role. Um, which is about um, s survivors of suicide attempts who are now going on to lead successful lives. Uh, we have time for some questions from the audience. Hi. I love your show, it's wonderful by the way, but it's really emotionally draining. How do you guys get yourself to that position every night and how do you like release such raw emotions day after day and do you have to do anything after the show to get your spirits back up? <laughs> That's a great question. It's, um, for me it's a difficult an engine to start because there's nothing that leads up to the scene where we reveal that we've just lost our son. So once we get over that hump, the writing is so incredible that we can ride it. And, um, and it's cathartic to feel all of the emotion, but it's also somehow um, therapeutic. And, um, and the writing is so good and that it, it propels us to places that we don't necessarily want to go, but we um, involuntarily go every night. And as far as, as far as afterwards or even in between the show, we make each other laugh every night. It's important to keep the laughter going. Do we have another question? Okay. Hi. Um, so this is pretty much for anyone, I guess. But um, for anybody, what do you think was the biggest surprise uh, that you experienced throughout your entire time working with the show? I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on that. You know, it's a surprise, and it's also not a surprise. But I think the success that we're experiencing right now I, I remember the very first reading that I did with this show, I was I was like, this is the most special thing I've ever read and been a part of. And, and I knew in my heart that this was something that was going to touch people in a very profound way. Um, but I, at the same time, never could have imagined actually getting to that point and seeing it you know, come to fruition, which is really, really cool and exciting and fulfilling. Either one of the, you guys want to talk about I was surprises? really surprised that I was no longer a size four. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's not a... <laughs> the, no, my, the biggest surprise was, I'm going to just say the, that first read through. Like it was, a, it was not only a surprise, but a giant present. Um, it's, I, I've never sat, read through something and been so moved so immediately by um, something I had no connection to. Or, or felt so secure that the right group of people were a part of this reading and that uh, the things that the writers had been talking about had come to real remarkable fruition. It really says so much that you guys have all been involved as long as you have. Um, you know, I mean, well, most actors you know, don't Jennifer stay with the project especially a year. turned down a whole lot of jobs to, to, to <laughs> stay here. That. <laughs> you know, I bet they so, got all of you. I mean, it's, let go. of course. No, but it's, it's really remarkable. Like, after that first reading, you can tell people were like, oh, I need to start shifting some things around uh -huh. because this has just come into my life, and it's extraordinarily special. Did you two spend any time together having like mother-daughter bonding outside the theater? Can't stand each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be about true to a teenage no. daughter and her mom. Um, we, are you kidding? Yeah, I, I think DC was just the most wonderful place for all of us because we we, we just spent every day, we, we went bike riding every day. Um, good, we went, good Murphy family bike uh, trip. Really, yeah. like the, we went on I a would, hike. Please <laughs> we tell me you found an orchard and went and had a picnic there. I mean, 
Yeah, we pretty much did that. Um, we saw all the monuments, and I remember Michael Park cooking us grilled cheese at like 2 a.m. Um, it, it was awesome. really, that's what started my addiction. Um, really? Yeah, it was DC, guys. You heard it here. We have time for one more question. Um, Connor's suicide is the driving force of the play, really, but it's never truly explained or gone into detail. Why do you think that choice works so well? Because I think you're able to bring your own interpretations to it. It, I, I, it, it. It's certainly very intentionally vague, the circumstances around that suicide, and I, I think that's in order to allow everyone to bring their own thoughts and interpretation to it and not be too definitive about what has happened or why it's happened. And I think, you know, Mike Feist, who plays Connor, does such a remarkable job about leaving so many doors open, so many possibilities open. I want to really emphasize and express my personal gratitude to everyone involved with this show for opening up this conversation, because I think even words like suicide are so difficult just to say out loud. And there is an entire community of people inside the Broadway community and way beyond that are talking about these issues. I talk to a lot of teenagers who have come with their parents to the show, parents who have gone on a grown-ups like date night to the show and then come back with their kids. Conversations are being facilitated and I think it's not a stretch to say that this show will actually save lives. So thank you for what you're doing on stage. Um, thank you for what you have done and continue to do off stage. and please pass my gratitude and all of ours along to everyone involved with this beautiful production. Congratulations and thank, thank you. you. Thank you.